Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webcast today on the impact of COVID-19 on U.S. workers and households. I'm Elizabeth Crowfoot, Senior Economist at the Conference Board, and it's my pleasure today to host this conversation. So today we're going to be addressing a number of topics that are relevant to uh, labor markets and associated with the impact of COVID-19. We've all been hearing about uh, the various industries and occupations that have been most impacted by COVID, and we're going to be talking about those, but we really want to shift the focus today on U.S. workers and households, and specifically the workers that have been most impacted by age, gender, race, average wages, and educational attainment. We're also going to be talking about the expected trends in unemployment, wages, and labor force participation rates of these demographic groups, as well as implications of job satisfaction and wage inequality and poverty rates. And it's not noted here, but we're also going to talk about some of the government policies that have been put into place during this time and how the programs are playing out on a more practical level, especially um, on the state uh, level. And uh, with those um, issues in mind, we can go ahead and get started. But there are a few webcast or a few housekeeping issues to uh, address first. Um, these are the CEU credits that are available for this program. If you would like to receive the credits, you'll have to stay online for the entirety of the live webcast and place your name, email address, and the credit type that you need in the designated box. If you would like to earn CPE credits, please make sure to click on the three pop-ups that will appear on the screen throughout the program. So without further delay, um, let's introduce our speakers today. So I believe joining us from Michigan today is Michael Horrigan, president of the W.E. Upjohn Institute for Employment Research since last year. And before that, he was part of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, where he served as the associate commissioner of the unemployment program, and before that, as associate commissioner of the prices program. Michael, we're really honored to have you join us today. Welcome to the show. And from Roosevelt Island in Manhattan, we are joined by our, by our very own Gad Lebanon, Vice President of Labor Markets for the Conference Board. He oversees all of our research on U.S. and global labor markets and is an avid blogger of labor market dynamic, dynamics, especially in this age of coronavirus. Thank you, Elizabeth. Welcome, Gad. It's great to be here. Great. And uh, I do want to remind everybody that this is supposed to be a very interactive session, so I do encourage those of you who have questions to type them into the uh, pod below, and we'll try to weave those into our conversation today. And um, also, do download the deck. We have a few slides with, uh, that are somewhat data heavy, so if you have trouble seeing them on your screen during the webcast, um, if you have those on your own uh, PC or device, it may be easier to look at those figures. So with that, um, let's go ahead and get started. And Gan, maybe you can take us through some of the implications of, of COVID on the U.S. economy and the labor market more Sure. Um, so unfortunately, we are in the midst of what seems like the deepest recession since the Great Depression. Um, and a lot of it, and not surprisingly, is because of the impact of a social distancing on several important uh, consumption categories, uh, an impact that uh, 
is now at its peak because of uh, all the shutdowns and uh, stay-at-home orders. But uh, even after the economies uh, open up, we'll probably see uh, uh, well below normal activity in many important uh, parts of the economy. And, and part of it will depend on, on what governments decide to, to shut down and what they decide to open. But perhaps even more importantly, uh, in the next year or two, it will also depend on what consumers are afraid uh, of doing and what they are not afraid of. So we are allowed to take flights, but uh, many consumers uh, are uh, worried about taking flights. Um, so kind of what industries will be most impacted, it depends on, on kind of both the risk of being infected in, in those consumption activities, but also by how discretionary they are or how easily uh, can we avoid uh, doing those activities for a year or two. Uh, so not surprisingly, the, a lot of the entertainment, lodging, um, uh, full service restaurant part of the economy where uh, those are things that have a relatively high contagion risk and things that we can avoid for a year or two they are probably going to uh, be far from recovered uh, anytime soon. Um, and on top of that, there will be like the second round effects. So in every recession, households have less money and less confidence to spend and businesses as well when they have to lower spending when uh, the revenues uh, go down. So there'll be much less spending it happens in every recession and this one uh, it will happen too um so uh, that uh, that means that uh, sorry um that means that uh, in uh, many industries uh, like manufacturing sorry got rid of this phone <laughs> um uh, that means that in many uh, industries, especially in manufacturing and construction, we are likely to see a, a big drop uh, in, in uh, even though it's not directly impacted by the social distancing consumption, they will also see a drop uh, later on. Um, beyond the, the overall economy, um, just to give you a preview, uh, of uh, what are the main uh, labor market implications. So the unemployment rate in the US uh, could very well be at 20% right now. Uh, and we think it will remain in double digit for the rest of uh, 2020. Um, it will be in, in recent years that those who attended our webcast uh, realized that uh, we are talking a lot about labor shortages. Now it is the opposite of labor shortages. In the next year or two, it will be relatively easy to recruit and retain workers. It will be especially easy to recruit and retain workers without a BA degree, because as we'll discuss later, a lot of the layoffs and the job losses are for workers that do not have a BA degree. So there is the opposite of what happened before COVID, where the labor markets for uh, blue collar and manual services workers was much tighter. Now it's going to be much looser. We're likely to see uh, wage growth uh, significantly slow down, um, especially for less educated workers. Um, we had uh, strong improvements in labor force participation in recent years for some uh, populations, especially minorities, especially women. And we are likely to see a reversal of this trend, unfortunately. We also had uh, almost a decade of uh, strong improvement in job satisfaction, uh, which reached uh, historical highs in uh, 2019. And we are expecting to see a, a drop in that. Uh, another important trend uh, that uh, in recent years, wage inequality was actually going down. Uh, People at the lower end of the wage distribution had faster wage growth than people at the top. And uh, uh, unfortunately, that's another trend that is likely to reverse again. And we're likely to see wage inequality uh, go up again. Um, for many employers, we were focused here on uh, workers. But for many employers, this period um, 
employers that are still hiring, that's a period uh, where uh, it's relatively easy, as I said, to recruit and retain and also upskill uh, their uh, uh, workers, uh, require more education, more experience, and uh, less pay uh, when uh, they uh, offer uh, new job openings. Um, finally, uh, and again, that's not something we're going to focus on in this uh, uh, webcast. We have another webcast in a few weeks focusing on teleworking and uh, the impact on that of that on the workforce and on business geography. Uh, so that uh, is, I'm mentioning it here and we'll uh, devote a lot of time to it in future uh, webcasts. So Elizabeth, that's the kind of top line introduction. Great, thank you so much, Gad. And I think this is a good time to go straight into our poll question. Um, so if we could bring that up, that would be helpful. Because we are very interested to see how our audience members and how their companies are currently responding to COVID-19. So um, here are the different options, uh, increasing hiring, reducing hiring, reduce hours work, cut bonuses, cut wages and salaries, furloughs, permanent layoffs, or other. And if you could specify that in the chat box, it would help us uh, get a sense of what other strategies organizations are taking during this time to um, cut costs, especially labor costs we know are, are uh, high on the agenda here. So we'll give this a couple more seconds. We'll close it in five, four, three, two, one. And it looks like um, most, about two-thirds, are completely or reduced hiring. Um, we have a, about a quarter that have reduced hours work and cut bonuses, um, close to a quarter cutting wages and salaries, about 30% uh, furloughing, only about 20% doing permanent layoffs. Um, Mike, I'll go to you. Do you have any reactions to this of how companies are navigating this well, COVID sure. I'm not, I'm uh, space right now? talking about an option that's not there, um, which is work sharing, um, especially under the um, uh, the provisions uh, of work sharing. Um, as we reopen the economy, as firms start to hire back up, um, one of the things that is an option for companies, and, and what we have found is that a lot of companies don't necessarily know about this, that they can use work sharing to offer reduced hours, bring people on board, and the folks um, who uh, have reduced hours can then receive unemployment compensation, including the $600 federal benefit. So it's uh, in some ways, uh, I think, uh, as a policy response, that may be a win-win situation for both firms, getting their valued workers back, and for employees in terms of income protection. Great, yeah, that's definitely something employers should uh, know more about, and hopefully they can take some takeaways from this webcast. Gad, did you want to add anything, any reactions? Uh, sure, yeah. First of all, I just, uh, there was a question here that uh, the numbers add up to more than 100%, and someone wondered how that could be. Uh, it's because we allowed uh, people to select all that apply, so some people chose more than one option. Uh, that's why it's much more than 100%. Um, I uh, would say that uh, what uh, is kind of interesting, because we have asked a similar question uh, with the option of permanent layoff uh, already in, in recent weeks in several webcasts. And I kind of, if I remember correctly, we're seeing the permanent layoff option tick up a little, uh, which is not surprising, I think, in many um, due to the second round effects, there are some companies that didn't lay off immediately, but they realized that their revenues are going down and they are slowly, more and more companies are uh, starting to lay off uh, people. Uh, yes, I think you're absolutely right about that permanent layoffs are starting to, to tick up. And if we could go back to the slide deck, please. I think it's really starting to impact uh, you know, the, the job outlook for a lot of consumers and uh, people. Um, what we're looking at here is the present 
present situation index from the conference board, and it really shows how the job outlook has plummeted um, in April. You see that those people that responded that jobs are hard to get really skyrocketed, and at the same time, those that responded that jobs were plentiful uh, took a nosedive. So it really goes to show um, you know, that the financial well-being of households is really driven by their employment situation. So to the extent that people don't have jobs or they don't feel good about their personal finances, they aren't going to be willing to spend. And that really begs the question as to are workers and consumers going to be ready to kickstart the economy once uh, economies do start to open up. And there is uh, some positive news uh, because laid-off workers are somewhat optimistic about returning to work. Uh, this is a poll from the Washington Post that was conducted at the end of April. And it shows that about 80% of those that have been laid off do you think they're going to be rehired by their same employer. So it does bode well for at least the sentiment or how workers are going uh, back into um, you know, their, the economy. Um, however, the longer that temporary layoffs last, the greater possibility that those are going to become permanent job losses. So there's already been reports of some companies uh, initially doing temporary layoffs and those becoming, becoming permanent. So that's something to watch in the coming uh, weeks. And then, you know, this is really where the government uh, has been stepping in to uh, really cushion the blow for workers and consumers. And it's trying to, you know, the, the policies that have been put in place are intended to uh, bridge the gap in incomes and spending. So these are some of the uh, policies that have been put in place. First, we've got the direct stimulus payments to individuals, part of the CARES Act. Also, the expansion of the unemployment insurance system, which I think is really the hallmark of all of this support. Um, it does provide an extra $600 a week on top of what states are already providing. It extends benefits an extra 13 weeks beyond the typical 26. It extends eligibility to workers that traditionally don't have this type of protection, so independent contractors, gig workers, and the self-employed. However, there is still a large proportion of workers that have been unable to access the support. Um, many of them are eligible but have not applied because state systems are overwhelmed. They don't have enough staff to process all. The claims that have come in, a lot of um, online technologies that the states are using are archaic. Um, so it's really causing a, somewhat of a burden on these state systems. And another implication is that um, many low-wage workers are actually earning more on unemployment than they were while they were working in their previous jobs. So this uh, new system or the new benefit package is really changing some of the incentives as to how workers choose to go back to work or, you know, if they will, once the economy starts to open up. Um, another program is the short-term compensation work sharing program that Mike uh, just mentioned. Um, it does cut, allows employers to cut hours and those uh, workers are still eligible for uh, unemployment insurance. And then we have the PPP program, which is essentially a job retention scheme that provides loans if businesses, or it forgives those loans if businesses are avoiding layoffs or rehire their workers uh, back during an eight-week period. Uh, but the issue here is that this program really isn't compatible with some of the generous unemployment benefits that are now available. So if businesses do offer their employees their job back, they can no longer uh, collect unemployment insurance payments. Um, so it really puts, you know, there's a lot of questions here. Do employers ask their employees to come back and earn less money and put themselves at risk um, for contracting the coronavirus if um, there's still an issue, especially in like restaurants, for example? Um, and businesses want to retain that employer-employee relationship and stay on good terms with their workers. So it, it begs a lot of questions. So in that sense, recruiting workers back to work uh, that are receiving these unemployment insurance benefits may be difficult uh, in the short run. And uh, may, uh, Mike, maybe you can walk us through some of the uh, trends in unemployment insurance and how that relates to you know, what we're talking about here with the government. Uh, one, just one quick comment on the um, on the different provisions that you just outlined. 
one of the things that we're talking a lot about now here in the state of Michigan is whether or not there's a possibility of having wage subsidies to employees when they come back so as to sort of reduce that difference between what they're earning on UI versus what they would earn, especially low wage workers, what they're earning back in their, um, uh, back in their prior job um, and whether or not that's possible under the provisions of the CARE Act. Um, what I want to talk about just for a couple slides, just some trends that we've been following at the Upjohn Institute. We've been doing kind of a weekly series and looking at um, uh, initial claims for unemployment insurance, both at the national level and then at the, um, uh, within the state of Michigan. So in this particular case, basically that surge began the week of March 15th. And um, it really uh, hit a maximum in um, uh, the second week uh, at 6.9 million. So we still have a lot of um, new claims for unemployment insurance, but the trend has been falling in recent weeks. Um, going to the next slide, um, what this really shows here is kind of a state map. In, in this particular case, the dark green are all the states in which um, the share of cumulative initial claims from March 15th to May 9th divided by a base period employment level, in this case what we used was the quarter one QCW um, uh, employment level by state. Uh, that's the quarterly census of employment and wages. And it shows that there are a lot of states that have lost more than a quarter of their, um, of their base employment from 2019 uh, in terms of the cumulative number of initial claims since the time that the surge began to the last report of May 9th. What I also want to point out, it's not immediately obvious from the, from the uh, levels of green here, is that there are actually 10 states um, that have more than a million cumulative initial claims. Uh, California, Pennsylvania, New York, Florida, Texas, Georgia, um, my home state of Michigan, Ohio, New Jersey, and Washington. And um, uh, within that, uh, four of those states, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Washington, all have lost more than a quarter of their uh, employees. Um, and then finally, this is just a national uh, chart from the employment situation last month, but I want to relate it to uh, what's going on in Michigan and it's probably similar for a lot of states. We lost a lot of jobs across all industries last month, uh, 20.5 million. And you can see that the, uh, the damage was widespread in terms of all the different industries that lost. Um, one of the things that's actually a little bit hard to get a hold of are state initial claims data by industry. Uh, we're able to get it in Michigan, but I haven't found a, a source that gets initial claims. There's a continuing claim database. But in Michigan, for example, if you take a look at construction, the loss of construction jobs represents 55% uh, of the base employment. Um, for manufacturing, it's 37%. Uh, for you know, Michigan, is autos. And in transportation equipment manufacturing, uh, which is a sub-industry uh, under, under manufacturing and durable goods, we're at 43%. And of course, everyone, every state um, is affected by food and drinking places. And in Michigan, we've lost 42% of prior employment. Yeah, I think this shows that it's not just those industries that are most impacted by social distancing, but it's really expanding beyond that now. And you know, it's the same is true for workers, right? They're also impacted um, by these uh, dynamics. Yeah, can you take us through some of the uh, demographic groups that are uh, having the most impact? Yeah, so what we did in order to see uh, which types of jobs uh, and which types of workers are more likely to be remain layoffed uh, for uh, quite a while, we divided all the uh, employment in the U.S. into a group of uh, two groups, uh, one group, uh, those that are most impacted by COVID-19 in the context of social distancing. So that's uh, 39 uh, million um, workers or jobs versus the rest, which is about 118 million. And the most impacted, we uh, looked at uh, entertainment, travel, lodging, food services, uh, some parts of healthcare and personal care some parts of retail sales, transportation, repair, and housekeeping. Um, and then we wanted to see how those two groups are different in terms of demographics, which demographics are more likely to suffer more as a result of the layoffs. So one thing is, uh, and Mike is going to talk more about it in, in uh, later in greater detail, uh, in, the, in our two groups, uh, the 
there are 78.4% in the most impacted uh, group that don't have a BA versus uh, 57% in the, in the other jobs. So a much lower uh, education attainment level. Also, we see that there is a much higher share of part-time workers in, um, in the most impacted uh, um, occupations. They are much younger, 22% uh, of uh, the most impacted um, occupations are people aged uh, 16 to 24 versus 9%. Um, for others, uh, they are much more likely to be women than men. And in particular, uh, Hispanic uh, women, there the concentration in those impacted uh, occupation is double their concentration in the rest of the economy. A lot of it is because of uh, the big category of maids and housekeeping, the cleaning, where Hispanic women are almost half of all workers in the US in that category. And um, there is a question here about the black workers and therefore uh, black men are not uh, particularly concentrated in the impacted occupations, but black women are. So uh, that's another category that will suffer more uh, than, uh, than most. And uh, we already see uh, in the April uh, numbers uh, of unemployment rate, we also see there was a big jump for uh, both, uh, for everyone, but uh, the Hispanic group is more than any other uh, group uh, uh, ethnic or racial group, there was a very large jump there, especially for women, as, uh, as expected. And uh, when we look at it uh, by education, uh, again, there was a, a modest jump for uh, people with a BA and above, but uh, a very large jump, especially for people without a high school degree, it's already over 20% uh, the unemployment rate. Um, so again, uh, very large variation. And uh, what that uh, could uh, make a uh, create impact is some disturbing trends that have been going on for quite a while uh, in the US economy. So uh, what we see here is the share of uh, men, uh, 25 to 34, who live at home with their parents or grandparents uh, by education group. So you see in the, in the blue uh, line, so that's the, share of men 25 to 34 uh, without a BA, and almost a quarter of them are now living with their parents. Uh, it's a much uh, sharper increase than for people with, uh, with a BA. So with the further deterioration in the work uh, prospects for those people is likely to um, continue this trend and, and make it even more extreme. Uh, now, uh, for a lot of people, uh, parents and children alike, that's not uh, such a bad uh, outcome, but uh, it is, it does have some negative uh, implications, especially uh, when you think about uh, labor force participation. So that's again, the labor force participation rate for men aged 25 to 34. And you see that uh, while there's been a drop in both people with a BA and not a BA, the drop for people without a BA have been much more dramatic. And a lot of it is because many of them are living with their parents and then they are less committed and in less need to be working all the time. So, um, so those trends are likely to become even more extreme now that the work prospect for people without a BA is so uh, is getting much uh, mm -hmm. worse. I think that this uh, trend in particular really resonates with uh, people that are in our audience on a personal level. Um, and it really shows that there are extreme differences by educational groups. And Mike, turning to you, maybe you can take us through some of the differences in education that are required for you know different types of jobs now, especially, and how that's changing due to the pandemic. Sure. So one, one quick note, when I talk about education in these slides, it's a particular classification system. Uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, looks at what is the typical education and training that is needed to enter an occupation. So if you look at any occupation, you'll have people that upgrade their education over time. 
but this is looking at the entry education that is needed. Um, and based on that classification system, there's a rather unique data set coming out of Minnesota. Um, when folks are um, uh, entering into unemployment insurance, one of the things that they, um, in the intake form that they report is their occupation. And Minnesota um, uh, actually publishes the, um, uh, the, the data by occupation on a weekly basis. And so what I've done here is I just took a look again at the, starting with the surge from March 15th to May 9th, I took a look at all the claims by major occupation groups, and then I divided it by occupational employment. So for example, food prep and serving related, the share of claims out of um, the employment for their occupation is 41%. And you can read down the list, there's some pretty high levels. It's, it's a little bit akin to an unemployment rate for the occupation in terms of um, the percent of risk, the uh, percent of the occupation that ended up being laid off over this surge period. Um, construction and extraction, 35%, for example. And what you kind of see here, and I'm gonna go into more detail on the next slide, is that um, typically occupations that require more education seem to um, have a lower percentage of their workers who have been laid off, partly because of what Gad was talking about in terms of the ability, for example, to telework. So let's go into more detail what I've done here is I've just taken a look at that classification system and basically um, took a look at the percent of employment um, that is in different levels of uh, educational attainment in those occupations. And basically the ones in yellow have um, the vast majority are post-secondary non-degree award, associate degree, bachelor degree, or higher um, that are in that occupation. And these are all the ones in yellow are the ones that um, BLS says are um, classifies as having a post-secondary degree award, associate degree, or higher to enter the occupation. The ones in green are some college, no degree, high school, or less to enter the occupation, such as food prep, building and grounds, personal care. The one um, that is what I would call a mixture occupation is healthcare support occupations. There's really a high percentage um, that are in uh, both post-secondary and above, and some college below. So I actually ended up labeling those occupations separately as a mixture occupation. But with that classification scheme in mind, um, the next slide is actually gonna be a little bit easier to read, but I just sort of, what I, what I really wanna point out here is that what I've done is I've taken a look at employment in May of 2019, which is um, from the Occupational Employment Statistics Survey. And then um, next in the following column in yellow is the cumulative initial claims in those occupations. Um, and then I did the same in green and the same in gray. So what I'm really doing here is I'm sorting um, the occupations by their typical education level. And to summarize across all of the ones in yellow and green is this result here. So for the occupations that require post-secondary degree or above, um, the May 2019 employment for um, uh, Minnesota was 994,650. The cumulative initial claims for those occupations was 142,000. So in other words, um, in May of 2019, those occupations comprised 34.5% of total employment. And in terms of the surge, they represent about 25% of initial claims. If you go down to the occupations that in green that require um, uh, some college, no degree, high school graduate or less, you'll see that although they represent 60% um, of employment in May, they're actually at 69.4% of initial claims. So there's initial claims being made by uh, up and down the educational attainment uh, distribution. So it's not just low wage workers, but um, lower, sorry, lower education workers but workers that are in occupations typically require less education tend to be overrepresented in terms of initial claims. Yeah, this is a really interesting result, and I think it uh, really follows from what we were seeing before on those industries that are most impacted by social distancing and the, you know, ties in with the demographic of the workers. And, uh, Jen, maybe you can tie in how worker wages uh, fare into this, especially from an educational standpoint. Sure. So um, 
And by the way, there was a question there whether uh, veterinarians are a part of healthcare, and the answer is yes. Uh, uh, that is also part of the healthcare uh, category. So um, I don't think that grooming of animals is a part of healthcare, but uh, uh, making them healthy is. Uh, anyway, um, when we go back to uh, wages, so before the COVID, we had a very unusual period in the history of uh, the US labor market in terms of wage growth. So you see here, uh, we, we kind of divided uh, employment into two groups, uh, management professional and related. So that's 40% uh, of employment almost. Uh, most of the people, the high paid and the people with a BA are in that group. And then all other occupation in the blue line. And in recent years, it was the only period, at least since the 80s, where the blue line was uh, significantly above uh, the red line. So you saw in the blue line, it was already um, growing very rapidly in recent years, uh, well above uh, 2007 rates, whereas for the management and professional, the uh, improvement was much more uh, modest. We think that this very unusual period, which also contributed to the decline in wage inequality is going to completely reverse now. Uh, because as we saw, a, a lot of the damage in terms of layoffs is going to happen to especially uh, the large uh, categories of manual services. So what I expect that we will see is that both of those uh, lines will start uh, trending down, but the blue line will trend down uh, much faster. And uh, you see that after the Great Recession around 2009-2010, it was the weakest period of wage growth in recorded history, but it was still above 1%. If we want to go to a period where it was consistently below 1% or even zero, you'll have to go all the way to the a great Depression. But I think now more than any other period since the Great Depression, we are likely to see a negative wage growth. I think it's still not going to happen, but we uh, may get very close to, to zero uh, wage growth overall, um, especially for new hires, especially for people who are entering uh, the labor market. Um, and to take a look at that, uh, here we see the wage growth. We divide it into people who age 20 to 24. So those are mostly new entrants to the labor market uh, versus the red line, which is all ages. Uh, we see a much um, uh, in, in periods after recessions when the labor market is weak, we see much larger drops for the new entrants. We actually had a pretty uh, uh, significant drop uh, in, in wages for 20 to 24 after the Great Recession. And I'm almost sure that we'll see an even larger drop uh, this time. And, and that partly relates, I think it's always uh, periods of recession are always difficult for new entrants to the labor market. It's something that stays with them for the rest of their careers, actually. But unfortunately, this time it's going to be a double whammy. Not only it's a deep recession, but it's also a recession that is concentrated in jobs that uh, have a lot of young people in them. So uh, it is going to be a very tough time for them uh, to the degree that uh, I think many of them will rather than try to um, to try to find a job in that time, they may actually uh, try to uh, increase their education. Uh, that is if uh, universities and, and colleges uh, ever open up again. But uh, uh, we may, we've may seen an increase in educational attainment as a result of the Great Recession, and we may see that uh, again uh, now. Um, yeah, so th that's... Uh... Yeah, there was a question that came in um, about whether there are major regional differences, especially urban versus rural. I assume um, about the wage uh, growth. Uh, um, there were some, uh, so for example, the Pacific, uh, uh, the California, Oregon, Washington, that was an area that, uh, as well as New England, those were areas that saw especially strong wage growth uh, before COVID. Um, I, I think uh, when where we will see uh, 
the biggest drop in, in wage growth is are in the areas that are more impacted by uh, the, the current crisis, in particular areas that have a lot of exposure to uh, areas that are vacation destinations like Las Vegas, Orlando, and, and many others. That's, uh, those are areas where the, the drop in the employment is going to be especially dramatic and unemployment rates are likely to be especially high. Yeah, and, and that's where wages are likely to drop the most. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I do apologize. It seems like we are having some technical issues with our question pod. So bear with us as we try to fix that. Um, but if we can go ahead and move on, we did mention that, uh, you know, with the unemployment schemes being what they are and being very generous, it does um, impact certain incentives. And there are some differences across states. and. Mike, uh, if you could give us a better sense of how this uh, unemployment insurance program is really playing out at the state level, I think that would be an interesting uh, case study to to yeah. take into account here. Uh, absolutely, and I, you know, like everyone else, I was very interested in trying to figure out what the impact of the six hundred dollar federal benefit on top of the usual average weekly benefit provided by the state. So what I decided to do, and this required just a little bit of setup, is I decided to take a look at the structure of unemployment insurance payments in Michigan in terms of who is qualified to get those payments when they're laid off and what those payments would be based on not just the eligibility, but also what the, um, the, the provisions for uh, weekly benefits that are made uh, in terms of your salary. Um, what I'm doing here is I took um, kind of a, as, a, um, as a case study, as I took OES data, Occupational Employment Statistics Survey data, for Michigan, and this is a very large sample across the country and a very large sample for Michigan. It's uh, nearly 1.2 million establishments across the country. And what it provides is um, for detailed occupations, um, sorry, let me just go back, um, it provides for every single occupation the employment level of the occupation, as well as the uh, cutoffs or the percentiles of the earnings distribution for the occupation. So it's average um, hourly earnings, but you have also the earnings at the 10th percent, the 25th percent, the 50th, 75th, and 90th percentile. So I use those earnings thresholds to basically infer the earnings profiles of people in Michigan um, in those occupations. So in that way, let's go through the exercise of saying, what if everybody got laid off in this particular occupation and then repeated across occupations, who would be eligible for um, uh, unemployment insurance? And how many of these folks would be earning more on unemployment insurance than they would in their prior job? So it's, it's that kind of sort of, um, uh, it's not using the actual people who have been laid off, but it's using the rules of the of the unemployment insurance system to evaluate what would happen up and down the distribution. So, Mike, the, there's just a question here in the pod about um, the time reference, May 2019, just to clarify. Sure. Uh, so um, this is the most recent data that exists for detailed occupation earnings data, um, establishment data at this level of detail by state. So um, this is published on an annual basis and the most recent data is May 2019. So basically what I'm doing is I'm gonna take a marriage of that data with the rules of unemployment insurance currently in Michigan and then add on the $600 um, added benefit. So in Michigan, for example, um, basically, if you earn $3,667 in your highest quarter of earnings, and you earn at least half of that over the other three quarters of a year's worth of earnings, you are qualified for unemployment insurance. And that gives you, um, for that $3,667, um, basically that translates into um, $7.05 an hour if you were to work 40 hours a week, 13 weeks and a quarter. Um, there's a second way of getting qualified. It's a little bit higher. It, it, that translates into $9.98. So basically what I did is I said, let's look at anybody that's earning $7.05 an hour or greater. Okay? And with that eligibility requirement, um, the question is, what is the amount that you would get for your weekly benefit amount? 
what you get is 4.1% times your highest quarterly earnings. So if you're that, at that minimum threshold of 3667, you would get 150 bucks a week. Um, as it turns out in Michigan, that is the minimum, the statutory minimum, minimum and uh, the maximum is $362 a week. So in other words, before we talk about the 600, what we're saying is that the most you can earn in unemployment insurance in Michigan, and every state has a different replacement rate, is $362 a week in order to then pay for everything that you have to pay for, your food, your rent, the mortgage, or whatever your particular situation is. Um, so the question is, um, what happens in terms of then adding the $600? Basically what we're doing is we're taking a group of people that move from 150 up to 362, which is the maximum, that becomes the horizontal line, um, and at that maximum it implies $9.05 an hour, and we are going to add 600 to that group, moving, shifting the line up, so that at the maximum you're actually in, in and it is equivalent to earning $24.05 an hour. So what, with that kind of in mind, what I did is I said, all right, what percentage of employees in various occupations earn less than $24.05 an hour, and what percent earn more than $24.05 an hour? Um, I don't have that lower level of $7.05 because the state minimum wage in Michigan is $9.65. So I just basically cut it off at $24.05, and you'll see from management occupations, 10% earn less than $24.05 an hour. Um, again, this is assuming that folks are working. Uh, this is an average wage per hour. So I don't have any information from OES on the number of hours worked per week or the number of weeks worked per year. I just have an hourly wage associated with the occupation. Um, all the occupations on this slide are, if you go back to what I talked about in terms of educational attainment, are all occupations that typically require an associate, post-secondary degree, associate degree, or higher to enter the occupation. And you can see that, for the most part, a fairly small percentage of these folks are earning less than $24.05 an hour. In other words, the ones that earn more than $24 an hour would be earning more on their prior job than on unemployment insurance. If you then take a look at all the occupations that typically require uh, some college no degree or less, um, a much higher, in some cases all, workers are earning less than $24.05 an hour. Um, protective service, for example, is at 62.3%. Healthcare support is at 100. Um, insulation maintenance and repair is at 56.7. So the overall result from this, um, and all I'm doing in this slide is showing the band at which, uh, the percentile band at which you start earning that max of 962. It really goes from 39th percentile to the 62nd percentile. Um, the kind of overall conclusion is that in Michigan, with 4.3 million employees, 2.7 earn less than 24 uh, an hour, or 62%. Um, the average weekly earnings on UI among that group is $897.75. In other words, not everyone's at the max. There's that sliding scale up to the max. And the average weekly earnings on the prior job for those same workers uh, would have been $598. So it is a ratio of UI earnings to the prior job of 1.5. Um, and what we're basically saying is that, um, yes, people are earning more um, than on their prior job, but it's probably not the same degree that people think it is in terms of that ratio. And it's basically protecting um, workers who um, are at, in lower wage jobs and also, um, it is a way of providing income support to accomplish social, social distancing objectives that have been in place, at least in Michigan, uh, until the end of May. Yeah, and like we said, that this is uh, could change some incentives in terms of you know those people at the lower end of the work or wage distribution and how uh, when they return to work. Um, they see some comments here about how you know that may uh, be impacting those that are uh, going back to work, especially in retail, could be severely disadvantaged by unemployment insurance schemes. So, yes, that's uh, basically playing out here. And, and, that's Scott, having, you, and, and that's why we're having the conversation about the potential of wage subsidies mm -hmm. to encourage, encourage people to go back to work um, as com in comparison to what they're earning on unemployment insurance. Right, right. 
And Gav, maybe you can talk about some of the uh, workplace and social impacts that we're that are coming out of this as well. Right. So, you know, some uh, in in recent recent years, uh, uh, relatively were very good years for for workers and households. Uh, one example is uh, the conference board has been doing a job satisfaction survey since uh, the 80s, and we've seen uh, uh, 2019 uh, was the uh, ninth year in a row where we've seen uh, an improvement in job satisfaction. Uh, a lot of the job satisfaction improvement was a result of um, factors that are very much related to the labor market, like satisfaction with wages, satisfaction with job security, satisfaction with growth opportunities. And uh, I, uh, we, in November, we are going to do uh, this survey again. And I suspect that uh, in 2020, we are likely to see a drop in, in that uh, because wages are likely to go down. Uh, people in general, are may more of them would be stuck in jobs that they don't really like, but they have to take because there are no other jobs. So we may see a, a drop in job satisfaction and, and perhaps in, in employee engagement as well. One a potential silver lining here is that, uh, and which we don't know the impact of, uh, is um, the impact of working from home. So we have a much higher share now of people working from home. Uh, may, maybe that will offset some of the drop uh, in other uh, elements related to our work. Uh, we'll have to wait uh, for November to to see. Yeah, there are some questions um, coming in about the job um, satisfaction. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. It's, uh, sure. It's about no, no, um, the uh, standard question. Is there one standard question that results in the job satisfaction score? Or is there a number of, of underlying questions? Um, so the way we measure, so we have about uh, 23 or so elements of job satisfaction. One of them is a question about overall job satisfaction, which I show you here. But there are uh, other elements that I, I briefly talked about. Uh, so for example, in satisfaction with wages job and job security are the ones that we've seen the strongest uh, improvement in the past uh, decade. And that's where we're likely to see uh, the largest drop uh, moving forward. Um, let me scroll and see and a uh, on whether we have uh, job satisfaction information by earnings level, whether it's uh, full uh, low wage versus higher wage. We do have by a uh, household income and, and in general, uh, the satisfaction level of people in uh, high earning households is uh, is higher. Uh, uh, it would be interesting to see if, if the drop that we're likely to see is it coming more from the lower earning household. We, we will know more in, in November. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, there's a comment here uh, that uh, maybe when if people are forced to come back to the office and take a subway when it's still uh, infectious, uh, maybe they will be less uh, um, satisfied with their commute to work. Uh, I think that that could have an impact. Um, uh, we don't have this uh, uh, by industry or occupation, unfortunately. Um, uh, okay. Uh, another uh, uh, thing that uh, a positive social development in recent years was the drop in wage inequality. In, in this chart, we see the ratio between the 90th percentile and the 10th percentile of wages and the ratio between the 75th and the 25th, both of them were uh, kind of on a downward trend in recent years. And as I mentioned earlier, I, I expect this uh, to start growing again as the people at the lower end are going to be more impacted. And uh, finally, uh, what's happening in the labor market in wages has a strong impact on uh, poverty rates. So in, in this chart, we show the uh, poverty rates uh, in the blue line for everyone, for the entire population. And we've seen a drop in recent years, but the drop was much more meaningful for uh, the black and Hispanic population where 
poverty rates reached all-time lows. Um, again, I uh, suspect that uh, with the current developments um, where the people uh, at the lower end of the income the distribution will uh, suffer more, and uh, especially people uh, of color, uh, we may see a reversal uh, in that trend that uh, it will push them below the, the poverty uh, threshold. Even though for the time being, the uh, uh, generosity and scope of the unemployment benefits and the direct uh, support are uh, making up for a big part of the drop in wages, but who knows for how long that, uh, yeah, that would last. Yeah, definitely up to the winds of our policymakers and uh, how long uh, this could, uh, the pandemic could last. And Mike, before uh, we sign off, just wanted to give you the floor if you have any other comments you wanted to make or reactions to some of these more social implications. Um, have you seen any information by state or well, um, so one of the things I wanted to mention, it's a, it's a group I'm starting to look at right now, so I don't have any firm results, although I have some hypotheses as to what I'm going to find. But if you look at the employment situation last month, what you'll notice is that uh, the, the increase in temporary layoffs, um, unemployed folks who are on temporary layoffs, was about 16 million. And um, these are folks that were laid off um, it does not matter if they're searching for work or not. It's, uh, the critical ingredient for unemployment is whether or not they're expecting recall. Um, if you take a look at the very same period of time and just compare it to the administrative data coming from unemployment insurance, over that same period of time, there's about 26 million people who filed for UI. Now, these are two very different, two different, um, one's administrative, one's a survey. But the point is, is that it would seem as if there's a lot of folks that lost their job from March to April who are out of the labor force. And those folks might be the most vulnerable in terms of what the impact of the uh, pandemic crisis has been on individuals. That is, they're not expecting to, despite that Washington Post poll of 70%, um, these are folks that are not expecting to be recalled. They're probably in more, in industries that are more highly leveraged that may not have as Big a chance to succeed uh, or survive, and I think that's a, that's a group of people that are going to need more training, that are going to need more assistance in the labor market in the coming months. I think those are really uh, great comments to end this discussion on. I mean, clearly this is just the beginning, and as we've seen, our policymakers are also trying to discuss whether there is additional support that is needed for workers and households and to what extent. So, um, like I said, this is just the beginning of this conversation. Um, but um, if you enjoyed today's program, there are some additional uh, webcasts that are related to this that are coming up, so please check these out. Uh, we also have our uh, coronavirus uh, or COVID ID hub that where we uh, gathered all of the insights uh, from the conference board on the impacts of on business and the global economy. So I really uh, encourage you to to visit this uh, website. And um, also, you know, just want to thank everybody for joining us today. I want to thank Gad and Mike. Uh, we really enjoyed having you. And uh, I want to remind everyone to please. Uh, fill out today's uh, evaluation form at the end of this uh, program that will pop up on your screen. And don't forget to download the slide deck as well. Uh, thank you again, everyone. This is uh, Elizabeth Cole Crowfoot from the Conference Board. And have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay.